So good afternoon and let me uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, luncheon uh, honoring Paul Wren's day and uh, Colonel Oliver has to paint and the home of our Regine Rich uh, Leadership uh, Institute. I want to thank you for coming to this historic site in, in our region to uh, welcome a, a Marist graduate and a, a national hero uh, who's played an important role uh, in our military. Uh, before uh, I tell you a little bit about the mansion and Ray Rich and Paul Wren and how they all seem to connect some way, which I'll be telling you about, I do want to introduce just a, a few individuals. First of all, the members of our Marist Board of Trustees that are with us, uh, Jerry Dahowski, Steve Efron, Richard Hoy, Dan Hickey, Brother Sean Salmon, and Betty Wolf. We're delighted to have all of them with us. Also, uh, we've had a great uh, alumni organization at uh, Marist College, and four of our alumni presidents are still very active in the institution. Jim Daly, Jack Everett, Bob Hatfield, and Maria gordon Slidewell are all with us, so I'm grateful to all of them being here. Uh, this uh, facility, this building, this home is really one of the uh, national treasures that we have uh, in our country. It was a historic home of Colonel Oliver Hazard uh, Payne. It was built by Colonel Payne in 1911. Colonel Payne was a Civil War hero and one of the 19th century's greatest in industrialists. Payne was born in 1839 to a prominent Cleveland family and was named after his ancestor, Oliver Hazard Perry, the great naval hero of the Battle of Lake Erie. The first connection you'll see between the three individuals that I mentioned. Payne was a student at Yale University when the Civil War broke out. And during this period, as you know from your Civil War history, most of the wealthy families in this country were able to buy their son's way out of military service for only $300. But the Payne family believed not only in the Union and that it should be saved, but they also believed in serving their country. Payne fought bravely as a member of the 144th Ohio Infantry Regiment and was wounded uh, during the war, but continued to, to serve and rose to the rank of Colonel. At the end of the war, he was promoted to the rank of Brigad Brigadier General for his meritorious service but he always chose to use his earned rank of colonel in his name. And speaking of uh, generals, I, I should note that General Pat Garvey is with us, uh, with someone who served with great distinction in the Marine Corps and uh, an individual who's been very much involved in our Hudson River Valley Institute. After the Civil War, Payne returned to Cleveland and founded a small oil refinery company that was later brought by John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller convinced Payne to stay with him in his new company and made Payne treasurer of Standard Oil. And Payne went on to become the co company's second largest shareholder and one of the wealthiest men, of course, uh, of his era. Like many industrialists of the Gilded Age, Payne, Payne wanted to build a mansion on the great Hudson River, and he chose the renowned architectural firm of Carrera and Hastings to design it. The same architects that designed the New York Public Library and the Frick Museum, two of the country's great uh, buildings. The Payne Mansion in, also includes an extraordinary boathouse designed by Julian Burroughs, the son of the American naturalist John Burroughs. This boathouse down on the river was built to support the Aphrodite, which was the largest uh, steam-powered yacht in the world at the time, the most famous boat. And if you want to take a look at it, there's a model of it that was given to the college just two weeks ago by the ancestor of Colonel Oliver Hazard Payne, who, who were here at the house uh, visiting. Uh, so be sure to take a look at that, at that boat, I think you'll enjoy. Payne was a famous yachtsman, and uh, he lived the Aphrodite during World War I uh, to the Navy, and again, it was used by the U.S. Navy during World War II. And interestingly enough, it sank off the coast of Greece, fitting in for a Greek goddess born in the sea named Aphrodite. One of the most remarkable things about the Payne Mansion is the railroad tracks that go up and down both sides of the Hudson River actually go around this estate so there'd be no unobstructed views of the river from here. Upon his death in 1917, Payne gave the vast majority of his estate away to charity. He gave lead gifts to found the Cornell Medical School, as well as generous gifts to the New York Public Library, Yale University, Hamilton College, and the University of Virginia, and several major research hospitals. 
The paint mansion was given to the Episcopal Church, which used it as the Wiltwick School for Boys, a noted home for troubled children. Eleanor Roosevelt took a great interest in this home and actually supported it during her years. And another interesting note, one of the school's graduates was Floyd Patterson, the Olympic gold medalist and heavyweight champion in the world, who actually served a term on the Marist College Board of Trustees. After the Wilkins School was closed, the mansion was purchased by the Marist Brothers in 1942. They realized they couldn't maintain such a major estate. In 1986, they sold the mansion and the boathouse and 60 acres to Ray Rich. Now we get into the story of Ray Rich, another military hero, another great industrialist, and someone who also loved to see. There are many parallels between Ray's life and Colonel Payne. Ray, like Payne, was a decorated hero, having served in both the Navy and the Marines during World War II, where he fought his way through the Pacific. He also enjoyed yachting, uh, and like Payne, became one of the leading industrialists of the 20th century. Ray was uh, born in L.A. and grew up uh, in Iowa. He founded several companies, five of which became public, but his most famous was putting together the U.S. Filter Corporation, which became one of the largest worldwide conglomerates that existed and ultimately was purchased by the uh, Siemens Company. Upon retirement, Ray focused on acquiring great estates around the world and renovating them and saving them for posterity. Ray invested millions of dollars to restore the Payne Mansion to its former grandeur, and upon his death, he gave it to Marist College along with a $10 million endowment to establish a program for leadership studies at our college and through Marist College around the world. The Raymond A. Rich Leadership uh, Program focuses on the subjects of communication, interpersonal skills, and social skills necessary to lead complex organizations in a global setting with a particular emphasis on values and integrity, something that we found in Colonel Oliver Hazard Payne's life and Ray's life and in Paul Wren's life. Maris plans to use this mansion for events and programming and to house uh, guests from around the world who will be involved in our institute. And the training we'll offer will be to our students, on our campus, on the internet, our branch campus in Florence, Italy, uh, all around the world. And so we're delighted you're here. And now the third part of this great story, the introduction of Paul Wren. Speaking of heroes and leadership in American history, it's highly appropriate that we salute and recognize Paul, Captain Paul Ridd today and thank him uh, for the leadership uh, that he has provided throughout his career. Paul is a 1968 graduate of Marist who has had an extraordinary 29-year naval career. He became known in the Navy uh, during the Vietnam War where he was both a trainer and a counterinsurgency uh, advisor in Southeast Asia, serving in several countries over there during uh, the Vietnam War. In 1998, he was a commanding officer of the USS Samuel B. Roberts when the ship struck a mine in the Persian Gulf. Despite crippling damage to the ship and serious injury to crew members, Captain Wren's leadership and the crew's <coughs> heroic actions that I think inspired by him prevented the loss of life and saved the ship from sinking. In recognition of his leadership, Captain Wren received a personal call from President Ronald Reagan and was awarded the U.S. Navy League's John Paul Jones Award for Inspirational Leadership. He was also inducted into the U.S. Navy Surface Warfare Hall of Fame. The experiences of his ship were recounted in the book, No Higher Honor, in which Paul gave credit to his Marist professors and his Marist liberal arts education for helping him through these very difficult and trying times upon uh, his ship. Paul is in residence this week at the Raymond A. Rich Leadership Institute. He's speaking to our students and faculty and others about his views on leadership, particularly what it is required of a leader in crisis situations. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a distinguished Marist graduate, Paul Rich. Paul. Thank you very much. It is a uh, distinct pleasure and honor to be here as part of the Raymond A. Rich Institute for Leadership and Decision Making. 
And it's always exciting to come back to Marist College, to a place where I always meet friends that I cherish, and individuals that have served the community and contributed to the college that have made such a great difference. Now it's very interesting because it's also an opportunity for Pam and I to get out of Washington, D.C. Now you know Bill O'Reilly talks about the people in D.C. of being spin agents. And, and when the New York Giants beat the Washington Redskins and we were leaving, it had just started. So by Friday afternoon, I'm sure in Washington, D.C., the score will be Washington 23, New York 17. <laughs> But another light, I think it's interesting, you know, when I was in the Navy, I used to promise my wife that I would take her someplace, you know, a big mansion on a hill and look over it. <laughs> <laughs> so Dennis, you've completed my bucket list in that category. Coming back to Marist is always very interesting. Why is that? Well, you always remember how it was, you know, and how things uh, transpired here that led to where you ended up. And nothing reminded me more of it than Chris DiGiorno's invitation to the, uh, to the event. And he laid out everything that I would talk about. It reminded me of Brother Brian Bislett's physics class. Ready? Describe the theory of the universe. Name all parts. What was your involvement? Be concise, one blue book, 20 minutes. <laughs> but seriously, uh, talking about leadership and decision making, this is a great place to come back to. Because you see, as I went through my time in the Navy, <coughs> sailors would look at me, officers would look at me and say, you one of those Naval Academy guys? And I would always say, no, I, I went to a real school. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the place where I intellectually formulated who I wanted to be, where I wanted to go, and how the heck I wanted to get there. And I use this institution as a place to hone those skills and to go out on that great adventure. <clears throat> Perhaps at the time, uh, a plan that was a road less traveled by many of our fellow students. But it was a path that led me to a career that tested me, that challenged me, that put me in position to make decisions that really were decisions that were about life and death, the people who worked for me in the real world. Maris made me ready for that. Now the 1960s was a very interesting time. The world was changing, there were a lot of things going on. But we had scholars at Maris, great men, that really put thoughts in our head and ideas, that made us think about what the country was about and the world around us, that really inspired us to think to think the right things about leadership. Now, it may come as a shock to some of you that I copied a lot of those down. And for years, I kept them kind of helped a skeleton in different pieces of paper. Until one day, my five-year-old daughter was sitting there and I was trying to teach her about memorizing things. And I said, Courtney, do you know the best way to remember this? And she said, yeah, Dad, write it down. So I did. I did. And I went back and I took all of those remarks and all of those things that our teachers had talked to us and our leaders had talked to us and I put them down. And then for the rest of my life, I recorded things that people would say. Things that would remind me of who I was and where I was going. And I kept it for 40 some odd years. There were comments in there, two presidents, remarks directed at me, they were good. There was a comment made by a senator of the United States government. Not so good. <laughs> Priests and rabbis, friends, colleagues, and yes, even adversaries and enemies. I wrote them all down and I remember them. And shockingly enough, and you can feel safe, Ortega, I won't tell them about the things in here about you. Hatfield, you're off the cuff. And Daly, you're safe too. So it's, it's okay. <laughs> Um, and I want to share those with you because I think it's very, very important. And some of these names you're going to know. Right at the top of the list was Dr. Tom Casey, who I once told in a class, I will never, ever use anything you have taught me in this class in my life. I was totally wrong. And four years after that statement in that class, on a, on a dark night, 
in the Mekong River, where my patrol had been pretty much shot full of holes going up the river and had to prepare to go south. To inspire them, I started talking to them about early American pragmatism. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> and suddenly I stopped and I shuddered and realized that the words of Tom Casey were coming out of my mouth and were inspiring the men who worked for me and were, were going to fight under me to be brave, to do their job, and to survive and succeed. So Tom Casey, the Tom Casey who said, know yourself, my son, oh, he used to call me that, life is about choices. The person you believe in, the person you become, is a result of those choices. Think well before you make a decision. Think well before you make a choice. There was another guy by the name of Bob Norman. Bob Norman. Be direct. Tell him what you're going to tell him, Paul. Then tell him it. And then, after it's over, don't figure out they heard it. Tell him what you just told him. I used that for 40 years. And I didn't just use it in the military. I used it in boardrooms of General Dynamics. I used it in boardrooms of Teledyne, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Be direct. Tell them what you just told them. Brother Edmund Cashin, an amazing guy, who would teach his class by telling stories and would really, really make you understand and want to learn and want to do things, said, life is an adventure. But by the time you explore it, that matters. Don't end up ever saying at the end of the road, I wish I had. Look back and say, I'm glad I did. Brother Gerard Weiss, one of the bad negative remarks. I was a C, C minus C student in Spanish. And Brother Gerard Weiss allowed me one time to take a remake. And I had told him about a dozen times, I just can't get this language stuff. It just isn't me. I ended up getting a B-plus on my makeup exam. And when he gave me the exam back, he said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. <clears throat> you need to use this opportunity to study and to develop like your life depended on. That's that important, Mr. Ren. So when I sit here today and I put a my pen now. I just told you that I really am not afraid to tell you that this was a great bunch. And I like coming back to Maris, but my wife is the prettiest girl in the room. <laughs> but don't think that when I stood in front of village chiefs in the Mekong Delta, or when I was helping people get out of Phnom Penh, Cambodia on the last day, and I was speaking like that to people that didn't look like you at all, that I didn't think Bernard Weiss wasn't standing somewhere saying, hmm. Don't be ashamed of yourself, my son. Paul Arrold. Paul Arrold was our crew coach. And he used to say things that to this day we haven't been able to figure out what he was talking about. <laughs> Put your heart out on your oar and give it everything you got. Ortega was in front of me in the shell. He turned and he said, what do you think he's talking about? And he said, I don't know. I think live your life with a passion. Live it with a passion to the best of your ability and do everything you can. And now lastly, the person that really impacted me the most, the guy who landed in Normandy, and by the time he got to the Rhine River, was the only guy left in his rifle platoon. <clears throat> a guy who he used to call Pops at the age of 20. Roscoe Balsh. When Roscoe Balsh knew that I was leaving Marist and graduating and going into the Navy, grabbed me by the shoulder one day and said, you just remember, the common man wins battles not generals. I never forgot that. Why is that? Because all of these lessons that I've told you about and all of these statements may seem simple to you, but they're not. They're not simple. Because they're all about leadership styles. I used Tom Casey's words on the Mekong River. I never thought I would ever do it and inspired people. I used the language that Bernard Weiss forced me to learn when I was at language school because I knew it was life and death, and I hadn't been smart enough to realize that before. Paul Arnold, 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 Ar
I just, that was really an inspiration to me to live it with a passion and really feel for it. And Roscoe Balsh, he really had it right. Because you see, leadership is not about standing up on podiums and telling people what to do. And leadership is not directing people and acting like you're the smartest guy in the world. Leadership is a lifestyle. Leadership is believing in your people and inspiring them to be better than they ever thought they could be. And making sure that they understand where they're going. So imbued with this, I went out into the Navy. And you would be surprised to know that my Marist education was really something that gave me an advantage. The sailors thought it was great that a kid from Marist and Poughkeepsie could step up, run the division. That I wasn't a Naval Academy guy and I didn't have some preconceived notions about what life was. But in essence, I created a series of things that I thought was important about leadership. Principles that I thought would just define them. Number one, preparation. Know the battle space. In the civilian community, know the market. Know who your adversaries are. Know what they're going to do. What's the worst case scenario? Wouldn't that have been nice if the guys on Wall Street did that a few years ago? <laughs> if the bankers did? Wouldn't it be nice if people did that and you wouldn't hear them say, I was surprised? Be prepared. Be prepared for all occasions. <clears throat> know your job. Know your job. Constantly get asked, what's the most important thing? All the students over here today and yesterday were asking, what's the most important thing? Honesty. Integrity. Be aggressive. Step up. Take a stand. Stand by it. Live your life. Be an example. People will follow you everywhere. All of you in this room have been incredibly successful in your lives. You, you will never know how many people you have influenced. You will never know how many people you have started in the right direction because they want to do what you did. They want to be successful like you. They want to be on the Yankees. Well, maybe not this year. They want to be successful. <laughs> Honesty and ethics. Trust and confidence. I always believed in making sure that there were no secrets on the ship. Did I think I was the best warfighter on the ship? You're damn right. Did I think I could take it to the enemy anytime I wanted to? You're darn sure. I was there to be the most vicious and violent projection of power of the United States Navy, and I damn well meant to do it. But I never thought for a second that I was the smartest guy in the world, and I always listened to my sailors, and I always became available to them, and I listened. And, the number, and I had a suggestion box, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but I always listened to what they said. And some of the greatest ideas I ever had on my ships were from sailors, who frequently would give you an idea and I'd say, damn, why didn't we think about that? Why didn't you tell me this sooner? And say, well, Captain, I thought you knew. You know, I thought you knew. So be, communicate, talk to them, and listen. The best part of communication, as I told the students today, is listening, <coughs> because you find out so much, rather than talking. Very important. Then train, develop, and then train some more. And make sure your people know that you're in it with them, that you care about them. What's the number one reason why people leave corporations in the United States? It's not salary. It's not promotion. They don't believe that anybody's listening and they don't believe that anybody cares. So they go someplace else. So when you're talking to them, and you're encouraging them, and you're with them, they will rise to levels of performance that will be second to none. Be forceful and confident, and invest in your people so they will invest in themselves, and you will reap the benefits of it. Never, 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 never give up on anybody. And George Wells, yeah, bottom 20%, we get rid of them every year. Really? Well, I'm going to tell you a story because I think that's the best way to get the message. I wanted to tell you two, but we're squeezed for time. My wife is not going to be told one just time, so I will. And I, and this is kind of a famous story in the Navy because it's about a young man by the name of uh, Michael Tilly, Fireman Tilly. Background: Samuel B. Roberts, newest ship in the Navy, commanded by the youngest captain in the Navy, and he's not a Naval Academy guy. And we are. Uh, we were doing really well in the early days of, of uh, creating the crew and putting it all together. And we have a record uh, that's second to none, especially a discipline record. We don't have problems. We don't have a lot of mass cases. Guys are doing their job. 
And then one day, this young man appears before me, Michael Tilly, from Wheeling, West Virginia. It seems that Michael showed up on the ship, and I used to talk to every sailor who came to the ship personally and ask him where he wanted to go, what he wanted to do, and I hadn't seen Tilly yet, and here he is at mass. And Tilly comes up to me, and the charge is, he has not one, but two ID cards that say he's 29 years old. Uh, Tilly looks 15 on his best day. And he has gone to a bar, and the bartender has refused to serve him, and the shore patrol wants to know why, and he says, well, I've got these ID cards, and here he is in front of me. So my master chief of the command, who's the master chief, sorry, and, and my executive officer think, Tilly's just a young and mature guy, and he just needs a good talking to. You know, that old fatherly discussion, you know, don't do this again. So he comes in front of me, sort of like this, and Tilly, you're, you've embarrassed the Navy. You've embarrassed your shipmates. You've embarrassed the ship, you know? What is wrong with you? Grow up, do this all. And I find him a little bit, and I give him a real stern talking to him. He says, Captain O'Reilly, you know, I'll straighten up. And I think, when I walk away from that podium that day and dismiss Tilly, that I will never see him again. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> so for the next four or five months, Tilly is working hard, but he's a guy who cannot make a good decision. If there's a remark to be made at the wrong time, he makes it. If there's something that goes wrong in an inspection, he does it. But, but the essence of the guy is he works hard at everything he does, and, and he really wants to do well. And so I, I think he's going to make it, and the ship is commissioned, and we go out to sea, and we have an enormous drug bust in the Caribbean. We capture two ships, um, several million dollars in cocaine and uh, heroin and everything, and the Navy is so excited about what we do that they give us a port visit in St. Uh, Thomas and the Virgin Islands. And so we go into St. Thomas and uh, have Liberty call. To remember now, don't embarrass anybody, don't do anything wrong. I've got a captain. Michael Tilly goes to Blackbeard's castle with four of his friends. And they have a few beers. You're all chuckling. I think you know where this is going. <laughs> and he decides he has to go to the men's room. And as he walks up to the men's room, there's a long line. And he looks outside the restaurant and he sees bushes. And he goes, oh, what the heck? And he goes out to those bushes, and behind him are the windows to the restaurant, which are all mirrors. And he thinks they're on both the mirrors, are on both sides. So you can write the rest of the story until he's in front of me again. And now, the master chief of the command says, Captain, I don't think this is going to work. I mean, Tilly, we maybe we should start thinking about processing him out of the Navy. And the XO says, I think the master chief might be right. So I talked to Tilly, and I just had this sense, just like you do, when you look at that employee that you just don't think is making it. And I, I think I want to throw him out of the Navy because I don't think he's right, but I really think there's a place for him, and I think he can really be successful. So I won't do it. I talk to him, and I find him, and I do some stuff. And Tilly promises he won't screw up ever again. Okay, fine. And Every time I see him after that, although he, he's getting better, but he's still doing crazy stuff, till he's head down rear end up and he is working. So much so that the, the engineers give him a space in the forward end of the ship called Auxiliary Machinery Room 1, which is way up forward, very hard to get to, very hard to maintain, and it has number one diesel, which we don't run very much, just because of a bunch of things. Till he's working hard, so hard you can eat off the deck plates. In fact, when you go in the space, everything's perfect. Everything works. Everything's where it's supposed to be. It's remarkable. And I like this kid. I really do. So I go down and bring him a cup of coffee one night, and he asked me, what do I have to do to be successful? I mean, how do I, how do I keep from getting the master chief mad at me? <laughs> and I said, well, Tilly, you gotta learn your trade. You gotta learn your skill. You gotta learn what to do and take your opportunities. Okay? Got it, Captain. You don't have to worry about me. Okay, I don't have to worry about you. Ship gets underway. Well, what happens is we, we have some very successful, successful missile exits, and this is during the Iran-Iraq war. And the Iranians and the Iraqis are shooting up tankers in the Persian Gulf and blowing them up. In fact, they blow up one of our ships and kill 36 of our sailors. And the president decides that we need to send three ships to the Persian Gulf. And he calls to the admirals and he says, who are they? And Samuel B. Roberts is at the top of the list. So I get a call, and it says, hey, Captain, get your ship ready to go to the Persian Gulf. Well, when? Six weeks. Six weeks. <laughs> okay. And, and so we pack the ship up, and I call the crew to, to quarters, and I look at the crew, and I say, I'm going to divide you in half. 
First half, this is just before Christmas, the first half goes and you must be back on the 26th of December. The second half gets to go right after that. Don't screw your shipmate. Be back on time because we're going to deploy the Persian Gulf on the 20th of January. And everybody says, yes, sir, we got it. Who doesn't come back on the 26th of December? <laughs> OK, this is good. You're getting this picture. This is like <laughs> So now, now the, the, the messaging for the command is literally, this is time, it's time to go. And the XO is totally on board with that. And Tilly comes to Mass, and I am now of a mind that Michael Tilly probably needs to go. Even though I think there's a place where I think he can do it, even I now I'm starting to become a little shaky on this. And so we get up there, and I'm about to sign with my pen the page four entry that administratively detaches him from the Navy. And he says, Captain, can I speak? And I said, sure, Tilly, what is it? And he said, please don't throw me out of the Navy. I have, uh, I have nothing else. I don't know my father. My mother's an alcoholic. My girlfriend broke up with me and stole my car. And my dog ran away. And that's why I was late coming back. And, and you may think this is a trick story, but I look at him and my ex who's standing behind me goes, oh no, I know where this is going. And I can't throw Michael Tilly out of the Navy. He said, you, I won't let you down. I, will, I, I want to serve my country. I won't screw up. And so in my heart of hearts as a leader, you know, the left side of the brain says, take care of this guy. He's the guy who's going to fall over the side, drop the, the, the projector in the magazine. But on the other side, there's a voice that comes from Marist College my friends, that says, you believe in this kid. Don't throw him over the side. So I don't. I make an entry that if he screws up in any way, shape, or form again, we'll just process him out of the Navy. In 29 years of naval service, over 240 days of combat, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, lots of, lots of tough stuff. It is the wisest decision I ever made. Because you see, if I threw Michael Tilly out of the Navy that day, I wouldn't be here. I guess I'd be dead. And so were 220 other crew members on San Jose Robbins. So now I'm inside the why. And why leadership is, is more than giving orders. We go to the Persian Gulf and, and we're engaged. We're, we're deployed 120 days, we've been at sea 116 of them. And we are conducting convoys, and we are running the Iraqis and the Iranians off. It is face to face, in your face, it's time to fight. And, and the crew is superb. And I can sit here today and tell you incredible stories about superb sailors and everything, but you wouldn't get this point, so I've got to bring this on. One day an admiral comes aboard the ship and says, the Iranians are just getting out of control. They're sinking, they're blowing up five ships a week. They are killing. 60, 70 people a week. They're affecting world commerce, but this is just getting out of control. Your job, should you decide to accept it, and by the way, it's not right. Your job is to go and stop them. If an Iranian ship starts to engage another ship, you go after them, you chase them. You can bring live missiles up, you can run him down, you can do whatever you need to do, Captain, but stop him. Don't take the first shot, but if there is a shot, you finish him. Thank you very much, Admiral. <laughs> there he goes. A few days later, as Mark Van Dyke pointed out to his class today in public affairs, I also get a call that says we're sending five AP correspondents to ride your ship. <laughs> what? <laughs> Left hand, right hand? Not talking so. That's a separate story. But anyway, this is how it evolves. For the next 25 days, we chase down the Iranians. We run off the Iraqis, and we chase off the Iranians. We're in their face. We capture lots of their boats. We break up a whole bunch of engagements. And the attacks on shipping in the Straits of Hormuz and in that part of the Persian Gulf go from five a week to maybe one, to maybe none. And, and it is on us. And we're running our ship down to 25% fuel, but the crew is into it and really like it. And the performance level is there. And then, on the way back from Kuwait after a convoy one night, just before dark, we end up in a minefield. The Iranians have decided not to take us on one-on-one. -on -one. There's a better way. 
Find out where they are, drop a minefield in front of them. And so we sail into the minefield, and I'm alerted and I come to the bridge, and there are two mines in front of the ship and one on the starboard side. I notify the crew and tell them we have to back out of here. Everybody go to your general quarter stations. I'm not going to sound alarms because there might be acoustic lines, but I can see my wake about five miles behind me. I'm just going to back down that trail. Got it? Yes, sir. Everybody's got it. Up in AMR1, Michael Tilly takes a look at that diesel and says, you know, the captain, the captain, oh, and there's something I have to do, but the captain probably might need this diesel down the road. So, hey, Bridge, this is Fireman Tilly. I'm coming up out of AMR1, but he doesn't go. He stays there and closes the hatch and dogs himself into the space. Now, something I, I left out is that during this time that we're operating, Tilly put something in the suggestion box. And it's a note to the captain. And the master chief brings it to me. And, and she was getting upset with these things when the sailors keep putting notes to the captain in the suggestion box. And so I made a number of them all so they wouldn't all go away. He came up and the note said something like this. Captain, you know, since we've been at sea over here and we're important to starboard, none of us down here in engineering spaces get to see the light of day. Don't you think? Don't you think you could put a porthole in the main engineering space so we could see daylight? Now, the master chief thinks it's grossly disrespectful. I think it's pretty funny. It's kind of been just silly. Keep that thought in mind about the, about the porthole. So, I try to back my ship out of trouble. The crew is up. We're doing the things right. And um, after about 30 minutes of backing down the way, the largest explosion I have seen in my naval career takes place. I'm 120 feet from the explosion. It breaks my left foot. It shatters everything on the ship that's horizontal. It breaks the ship in two. Only the main deck is intact. The flames are 100 feet above the ship. And the debris is falling on us. Another comment. My XO looks at me and says, as all this stuff is happening, he goes, yeah, hey, Captain, remember your last promotion? And I said, yeah, what the hell was that up to do with anything? And he said, well, looking at this, I think it was just that. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're in this situation and we're fighting for our lives. And, and there's a lot to tell you and a lot of heroic actions by a lot of people. But if you remember the, the, if you remember the movie Titanic, when, when the actress goes down to save um, the actor who's, who's handcuffed in the bowels of the ship and the lights start to flicker and the water is there, we were there. We were there. And we had made a lot of decisions, one of which was to stop fighting the fires because we were sinking like a rock and the water was just making us sink further. But the other problem was we had no diesel generators left and there was no way to get to AMR1 and nobody knows that Michael Tilly is up there until he picks up the sound power phones and calls back to CCS and says, hey, this is Tilly in AMR1, what do you want me to do? And he says, start that diesel. Never done it before. Where about my pay grade? Don't know. But Tilly's been reading the car and the instruction. And so he says, okay. And he goes in and he lines up the diesel and he gets it fixed and he notices that the governor is fractured. And the governor takes 1,500 PSI air and reduces it down to 150 PSI and spins the wheel that starts the diesel. Tilly's gonna have to do this manually. So he climbs up on the diesel. Three mass case kid, you know. He's never done it before. Takes the instruction card, opens the valve, and the air from that 1,500 PSI flask comes out, and it sounds something like this. Zzz, bam! And Michael Tilly starts the diesel. My God. And he climbs down off of it, and he normalizes it using the card, and then he walks out into the space, and he calls back to CCS and says, I got the diesel started, now what do you want me to do? And they said, get it to the switchboard. So Tilly picks up a card that an electrician would have with about 10 years of service. He reads the card, he lines up the switchboard, and he's about to reach up and touch the switch to bring power to the grid as I'm walking out of AMR2 and thinking, I think I'm gonna to have to abandon ship. And is that a critical moment? There are ships 80 miles away. I'm in a minefield, we got sharks and snakes in the water. It is a defining moment. And all of a sudden, the lights go as bright as that. In essence, Michael Tilly, three mass cases, not sure he's gonna make it, saves Sam with the rockets. Does it to his own initiative. Does it and saves the ship. Now something you need to know is Tilly, <laughs> Tilly
Tilly is afraid that since he disobeyed orders to not come up above the main deck, that if he ever tells anybody he did this, they'll know, and they'll throw him out of the Navy. So he never tells his soul. And, and a lot of things happen, and we, we get the power back, and we're able to lower the APUs, and this is, a, this is a pitch for God, to be honest. We're in this minefield. <clears throat> I don't know where to go. Turns out there were 14 mines in the minefield. My crew tells me this, but I have no recollection of it. I went to the bridge. I told everybody to get away from the chart table. I picked a course, 147. At the board of inquiry, Oli Atmo said, how did you ever pick that course? And I said, I'd love to tell you a John Paul Jonesian thing, but the reality is, I don't remember. 147 was an important, there were 14 mines in the minefield. We lowered those APUs, we lit them off, we trained them, I told them, told the block bridge watch, come to course 147. We sailed 26 miles on that course. We passed between three mines that were 100 yards apart. We got out and we survived. But the power and all of that effort was provided by Michael Tilly, and the ship was saved. A kid who would have been easy to let go. So it's a lifestyle. But I've said, don't ever lose your sense of humor. So here's, the, here's some postscripts on Michael Tilly, just so you know. When we got into the dry dock in Dubai, they put us in a, we're in Dubai, they put us in a one million deadweight ton dry dock. 4,000 ton ship, one million deadweight ton dry dock. So it was kind of enormous. And after we got everything cleaned up and we assessed the damage, I told the XO I was just gonna go out and take a look at the ship. And I went out and walked along the side of the dry dock and I sat down and I looked at the ship with a 30-foot hull, no keel, I could see all the way through it, and totally burned all the way back. And I was feeling, feeling particularly sorry for myself. And then all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, the ship's master chief started walking towards me. Almost like the Wizard of Oz. And he had a piece of paper in his hand. And he walked up to me and I said, Master Chief, what is it? And he said, Captain, it's that damn Tilly. And I said, no, I know, I know. At this point, I know that Tilly's the guy who did this. Master Chief doesn't know. Because Tilly thinks he'll be. So he hands me this sheet of paper and I have it to this day. I opened it up and I looked at it from Fireman. It was in my suggestion box. To Captain Wren from Fireman Tilly. Captain, with regard to the request for a porthole in the main engineering space, you have exceeded my wildest <laughs> There's much more to these stories, so I have to tell you. I'm laughing so hard, I must fall in the dry dock. The master is just beside himself. Okay. <coughs> you, you may wonder how badly Samuel B. Roberts was damaged and how significant this was. So I will tell you, every year I speak at MIT, the Marine Engineering course. Um, they have modeled the ship for 15 years. It never stays afloat more than 28 minutes. Uh, David Taylor Model Basin invited me over to see the model run in the tank. You know, it really doesn't do you any good to watch your ship sink. <laughs> <laughs> so you may wonder, where, where is Michael Tilly today? Where, where is he? Well, Michael Tilly stayed in the Navy for a while, and he rose to the rank of second class petty officer, and was very successful, and probably would have done okay. But he got married, smart man, and his wife said, Navy, hmm. Separation is not good, you know, too much time away, very dangerous, very dangerous. So he got up and he went to work for John Deere and rose to be the assistant manager or general manager of the John Deere tractor distributorship in Lewiston, Maine. And then one day, a fella came in, a friend of his, and said, Hey Tilly, what do you know about turbines, wind turbines? And he said, Oh, not much. I started a diesel once. <laughs> so he said, I need a partner. I'm going to Colorado. I'm going to start a company. Until he said, I think I'll go with it. Today, Michael Tilly is worth millions. Michael Tilly is the chief operating officer and senior vice president for the power company that provides the state of Colorado 23% of their power. It's about your people. It's a lifestyle. Don't give up on them. Inspire them and bring them to a place where they never thought they could be. Each of you in this room is incredibly successful. It's part of why you're here. 
but you have amazing capabilities. And already in your lives, you have inspired tremendous numbers of people who want to be like you. They want to be successful. They want to be on a winning team. My question for you today is, how many of you have Michael Tillys in your organization? How many of you have Michael Tillys in your company? How many of you have Michael Tillys in your college? And are you going to light that spark? Are you going to hang in there with it? It's all part of the journey. Remember what Devin Cashin said. You want to look back and never say, I wish I had. You want to look back and say, pretty good road. Thanks for coming and listening. God bless you.